design thinking. People talk about design thinking, but what is it really? How do you do it? And do you need it, or is it just the latest business buzzword? Welcome to I Love Content. I'm your host, Laura Burgels, and with me are Scott Smith and Elizabeth Godey. And our special guest presenter today is Carol Glanville. Carol's here today to talk about the design thinking and the design thinking process. Carol is the founder of Contemporary Education Solutions. She helps schools, districts, and small businesses integrate instructional technology. She has over 25 years of experience as a classroom teacher and administrator. Now, Carol uses the design thinking process to help clients create customized technology solutions and training programs. Just to give you a little bit of follow-up to that intro, I am working with small business schools and community organizations. Um, and what I do with design thinking is really just facilitate that problem solving and strategic planning process, whatever your um, industry may be. So I like to start with this um, little graphic of the turtle because um, what this is, is it kind of sets you up for this whole idea of design thinking in which what you're doing with this process is it really helps you to set aside your assumptions and look at your situation from an objective point of view, right? And so this is going to allow you to see a new way of doing things. And it also opens you up to potential opportunities as you explore your various solutions that you might have missed in a more traditional process. So what is design thinking? <laughs> Design thinking is a process. And in that, it can be a little bit messy at the start because we're not landing on a fix or an idea right at the beginning. We have to consider what our options are and what our, our actual setting is. And we'll go through those steps um, briefly this morning or today. Um, so it's process driven. It's also empathy driven, which means that you really have to get to know um, your customers or your end user or whoever that person is. And even if your problem seems um, or situation seems very focused on the interior of what it is that you're doing, the, the goal is always better service to your customers or better service to your organization or better service to your students and your parents. And so no matter what you're doing, you're always, you should always have that outward focus. And a lot of times we tend to focus inward instead. Um, the other thing is that design thinking is solution focused and you'll see how that works. That a lot of times we look at our problem and we kind of think our problem is our solution. Um, when in fact, there's something else going on. And so at the end of the day, design thinking really allows you to explore the possibilities that will create a desired outcome that benefits your end user. And so like I said, it gets a little messy there at the beginning, but then it smooths out as you start to explore what the options are. So to see that a little graphically, a little visually, like this is what design thinking looks like. It's an iterative, iterative process. So it is nonlinear, and we're going to walk through each of these little steps today, starting with empathy um, and then defining ideate, uh, prototype, and test. And I'll show you how those work together um, in more detail. But just to give you an example of what this might look like in a business setting. So I was recently at a networking luncheon, and I met a painter, an interior painter from across town from me, and he mentioned that he'd like to be doing some more work in our area and that he's worked out by me before. But it's, you know, it's kind of a long distance. It's like 30 or 40 miles. And so I suggested that, you know, we got talking and I said, well, maybe distance isn't your issue, but rather a lack of connection in our area. So coming to this luncheon is a great way for him to start testing that idea of how might he expand his business to this side of town. And so rather than thinking of um, the distance, so how do you shorten that distance, right? How do you make those connections? So looking at it from a different point of view can help him to jumpstart what he might be doing. So um, starting with the problem statement, uh, there's a problem with problem statements, as I mentioned before, and that is that they, um, well, first of all, they're inherently negative. Um, and so they often become stopping points rather than starting points. Um, and they can also kind of head you in the wrong direction. So if we look at this problem statement, and I'm gonna use this as an example throughout our little process this morning, um, you know, thinking about client base. So maybe you're a small business and you think to yourself, you know, we really rely heavily on just two or three, like a real small number of customers. That's our problem. And if you're a school, this would mean that maybe your funding is going down uh, because your enrollment has dropped. So we need more students, right? And if you're maybe a community organization, you're trying to think of like, you know, we serve a fairly limited number of clients. 
So how can we kind of expand our outreach, which looks a lot like the business model, a business issue, but you might approach it a little differently. So, so notice how these are problems, and as I said, they're negative. So I'm going to show you a short video of a problem um, and how somebody tries to solve it by using the problem as the solution. And this is just a quickie. It's about a minute long, so stick with me. I think you'll enjoy the outcome. Right? <laughs> so see by how focusing on the problem as the solution, his head is stuck. They were missing the obvious or maybe not so obvious solution of just getting his body through those bars. <laughs> so a perfect example of how design thinking can support success in what you're doing. So again, I want to take a look at our problem statements, but I'm going to line them up now next to a little shift in thinking. So instead of making your problem a statement, I'd like you to think about turning it, first of all, into a question. And this is the question frame we use for design thinking. It's how might we? And you'll see it abbreviated as HMW. In fact, there's a how might we bot on Twitter. So if you tweet something HMW with a question, they'll retweet it. <laughs> um, so, so look at how we change this problem, this stuck statement into an action item simply by turning it into a question of how might we diversify our client base? How might we increase enrollment? And how might we increase outreach? So now instead of thinking of a problem, we have an action step, right? Something to work towards. And this is where we're going to start working on our design thinking process. So now we have our challenge or problem or um, goal, whatever you want to call it, um, kind of in place. What we think it is that we need to be heading towards. And so we're going to put it through the design thinking process and see what happens. Starting with empathy. Um, when you empathize, what you're really trying to do in this step is to learn about the audience um, for whom you are designing. And so the thing here is that you really need to do a lot of observation. You want to look, listen, and learn um, as much as possible. And you're going to ask a lot of questions. And the key here is do not assume to know the answers, right? So don't assume that location or cost are your mitigating factors to increasing your client base or increasing enrollment or reaching more clients. You need to not only look at who your current clients are to see why they want to be serviced or what they get out of your company, but also look at who's not your client and find out what you can do to reach them, right? Um, you want to look at your competition. You're probably going to be doing some networking here to find out how other like organizations are doing this task or approaching this. When you ask these questions, this is really important and this is something we tend to try to skip over. <laughs> these different question types. There's factual, conceptual, and debatable. So factual questions are fact questions that are based in data. They are observable. Again, do not make assumptions, right? If you only have five clients in this geographical area, do not try to figure out why. You are just stating how many clients do we have in this geographical area done, right? Then after you've collected all that really factual observable data, you can move into conceptual questions. And in the conceptual questions, you are inferring from the information you have. Again, you're taking what you have, I think X, because of what I observed. So knowing that I have five clients within this geographical area, I think 
I could get more clients because there are 10 potential clients in this geographical area. You're still holding on to that fact, right? Then you can move into debatable and debatable is where you start kind of solutioning. Um, so then you're asking yourself, I wonder if, or what if, um, you know, how might that work? And so, but you got to start at factual. We try to skip factual and jump right to debatable and go, I wonder if I did this. <laughs> and we're missing that step of really looking at what is the data telling us. Um, so here's some um, examples of how you might do this. This was a, the group that I was doing some training on design thinking. And so they met with an organization, with a company. And in this first step, the goal of this particular um, piece was to develop some client communication tools. And so what they did in this first step was the company gave them a uh, presentation about their company. What is it that we do? What are our mission and goals? Um, you know, where are our pain points and things like that so that we could really understand what it was that they were working with. Um, and in this example, in this one, a little bit different setting where we're working on designing, redesigning the entryway to this particular office, which was a very awkward space. And so in this one, we're talking to the actual employees to ask them things like, and getting in their shoes, and this is so important, getting in that space with them. So I can maybe sit at that desk or stand in that spot and see what's the sight line to that entry point. Is that really distracting to me? Am I expected to be this, you know, the receptionist? And then if I were to redesign the office, what does that mean for the employees? I mean, you can see there's a lot of natural light in this office space, so moving them away from the windows might not be a good solution you know so so we want to like get the information from them we want to walk in their shoes a little bit and this might include and probably more often would include something around surveying um, and you could do a real simple survey you can even do like a two question you know thumbs up thumbs down like on a Facebook poll to get some basic information from potential users or clients um, as well as the people who already frequent your business so you want to gather all of that data and then out of that data, we're going to step back to our problem statement and take another look at it and focus it in. So we're going to redefine our challenge based on the observations that we've made. So we're going to take those challenges we had of how might we diversify our client base. And maybe we've discovered it's not that we need to diversify our client base. It's that we need to raise awareness of our company. So now we have a marketing issue, right? Um, and then maybe instead of trying to increase enrollment, what we're looking for really is to better engage parents so that they want to enroll their students in our school. So how do we rethink parent-teacher conferences and um, open house nights and things like that? And maybe for our um, or our nonprofit organization, you know, they're looking at it's not that they don't have a maybe it's they're not providing services at the time when people can really take advantage of them. So now we're looking at maybe an employment issue of how do we get people to work different hours or can we be open during different hours and things like that. So you can see how the problem has shifted quite significantly just through that observation phase into a whole different focus for what it is you should really be thinking about in terms of planning. So the next step then is figure out how we're going to do this. <laughs> Um, and so in brainstorming or in ideating, you're brainstorming and just coming up with, it says solutions, but I want you to think here you're coming up with ideas for potential solutions. And this is where you see all of the post-it notes going on. And you can see that in this picture here. Um, there's quite a collection of post-it notes. Um, we all like to think we know how to brainstorm, but um, a lot of times we, we kind of do it in a, in a not, not very productive way. And so I've pulled IDEO's seven rules of brainstorming here for you. In case you're not familiar, IDEO is the seminal organization that really has brought design thinking to the masses. Um, and they have a wonderful set of rules here. First of all, we're going to defer judgment because what we're looking for are these really wild ideas. Um, seemingly outrageous ideas. May two crazy ones might combine into one really good one. Or a super outrageous idea might help you envision something like more pragmatic. Right. And so that brings us to number two is that encouraging wild ideas. So think about like maybe you're a restaurant and you want to again, you're trying to get more people to come to your restaurant. So maybe a wild brainstorming idea would be, you know, we can kidnap people off the street and tie them in our chairs and force feed them our food, you know, <laughs> which is a crazy idea. And your, your gut reaction might be that's ridiculous. We're not doing that. Right. But that crazy idea can turn into, oh, OK, how do we get free samples to people? 
maybe we can start um, doing a little pop-up shop or, you know, partner with a food truck or something like that. So that crazy idea of kidnapping people and force feeding them turns into something really a workable solution. Um, so you wanna build on the ideas of others. And you can see again in this picture that they have done that. Um, you can see that from the grouping of the post-its. So as you kind of combine them together, you're seeing how your ideas work together. You wanna make sure you stay focused on the topic one conversation at a time. <laughs> don't talk over each other. Also, don't justify your idea. <laughs> you're just sharing ideas. Um, you're not trying to sell them. You're just throwing them on the table, right? Or on the wall. And then you wanna be visual. You might have to sketch things out for people. People tend to be very visual. Um, and you wanna go for quantity over quality here. Again, we're not judging our ideas. We're just getting as many ideas out there as we can so we can see what floats to the top. And again, if you look at the picture of them brainstorming, um, you can see again, you've got quite a few sticky notes, but there's some really like larger groups there. And so they're beginning to see these are probably the two or three things we're gonna combine together into our final solution. I and mean, then you see that by noticing, oh, we all had a similar idea around this, or these two things kind of um, you know, support each other um, in, in being accomplished. So, so that's your brainstorming piece, ideating. Then we move into prototyping, and this is where we're gonna create some kind of representation of our solution um, or our idea or whatever that is. Um, you wanna be able to show that to others, and even if it's a process, you wanna have a visual of that. Um, so a uh, process can be visualized maybe in a flowchart um, or something like that. Um, you know, if you're doing a website or an app, you probably have a storyboard and that's like your visual representation. So again, in this example, you can see um, these ladies are suggesting this communication solution from the beginning. Um, and so they've created a visual kind of a flow chart there. And then they also have a, a mock-up folder of what the communication pieces would look like um, and how they would be put together for a potential client. So your pr prototype could be, again, it can be like a, a rough draft of something, it can be an actual physical model, it could be a sketch, pretty much anything that you're gonna, you can just kind of go back and work with um, and have an idea exactly of what it looks like. That also helps you to think about materials you might need if you are constructing something, like is that really gonna work, <laughs> you know? and things like that. Um, and then the last step is test. And so with testing, you're gonna return to your original group, your client or whoever they are, and it might be yourself, it might be you know whoever that is you've kind of um, decided to have in your focus group. And um, you're going to just measure what you've produced against what they you originally wanted. Does it match up to that definition, that, that statement we came up with in the define piece? And if not, then we need to maybe go back and reiterate and ideate a little bit more and, you know, tighten that up. So I want you to remember, like, using Apple as an example, if I may. <laughs> um, you're not going to test to perfection. The iPhone is not incredibly successful for Apple because it is perfect. In fact, quite the opposite, <laughs> right? It is through their upgrades, their software changes, comments from users, all of that is constantly being reiterated. But they didn't wait for the perfect phone to put it out on the table, right? They started selling with their, their first best prototype. And then they went back immediately and started making changes and updates. And that's what you need to be thinking about is that whatever challenge you're facing or process you're creating, you're gonna go back and continue to tweak it as it grows and as it becomes successful for you. Um, so just remember that as you are, testing isn't finished, <laughs> you're gonna go back and iterate that. And that's gonna take you back to ideate, prototype and test, um, and maybe even further back into defining that original issue. Maybe you're gonna decide, you know, we need to focus that marketing piece on a particular segment, and that's gonna shift then what our prototype looks like. So I just wanna give you a couple, another example here. These are kids, anybody can do design thinking. And these kids were asked to raise um, some interaction at a local community garden. And so they came up with a few ideas um, and these ideas were put into action immediately. 
The second one from the left was a paint a picket fundraiser they thought of because as they were observing the garden, they realized they had a picket fence. Um, and so they thought in order to engage the community, people could come and be charged to paint the pickets. And so the company, the organization was like, oh my gosh, why didn't we think of that? <laughs> we have like a thousand pickets. And so at $5 a picket, you know, that's a pretty simple fundraiser. And they did within like a few weeks, they raised a couple thousand dollars based off of this design thinking process that they went through with these kids. So um, as you can see, design thinking is very collaborative, right? Um, anybody can participate in design thinking for themselves. Um, I do it all the time, but it really helps to have a coach or facilitator, especially as you're starting the process, um, because it helps keep you on track. Um, it also helps you to avoid skipping steps, which is really, really tempting. Um, and it keeps you honest. Like subjectivity is the enemy of design thinking. Uh, we tend to think of what we know instead of what we don't know. And so by honestly being able to say, you know, I'm not sure, or that's not something we've done before, um, you know, you want your design thinking to be forward planning, right? It's easy to get bogged down in rehashing what has or hasn't worked in the past, but if you wanna work, you know, what, what's gonna work for the future, you need to start doing some forward thinking. And these are, of course, my beloved World Championship Cubs <laughs> who proved that after 100 years, you know, they were still able to coach themselves through a process of change that brought them to real success. I have a question. Um, versus the comment, um, well, this this hand uh, shook the hand of Ernie Banks, speaking of the Cubs. Uh, and, um, <laughs> oh. So, <laughs> and so uh, just uh, something about the iPhone is that um, one of the things that I'd read, you know, recently, like a couple of years ago, is that they were still iterating a few weeks before it shipped. You know, one of the things that happened was that um, Steve Jobs reconsidered the plastic screen. Yes. And he said that um, people are going to put this in their pocket mm -hmm. with their keys. Yeah. They will never buy a second iPhone. Right. If, if the screen is scratched. Mm -hmm. And so, like, within a few weeks, they put together a – they contract with a vendor who made gorilla glass or some other sort yeah. of uh, glass material very difficult to cut more so than plastic they were mm -hmm. able to solve that but that was done within like a a few weeks i don't think it affected the deadline but um i'm sure that people didn't get a lot of sleep uh in the month leading to the other uh, shipment the engineers especially right yeah i've heard that story too that like that was a big piece he put the phone in his pocket and it got scratched up and he was like wait <laughs> And so there's still, I mean, we're just now getting these foldable phones and people have been talking about them for a long time because people put their phone in their pocket. Right. <laughs> so how do we solve that? Well, prior to the iPhone, the um, the trend was towards smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a gag on Futurama years ago about a guy swallowing his cell phone. <laughs> like it was a bug or something like that. But you know, when you start putting high quality screens on there, people want to watch right. movies. Right. Yeah on there so they're bigger and bigger i think well, the next and thing that goes back to design thinking is like really responding to your user like our plan might have been to do this but we need to be able to set our again set those assumptions aside and set those plans aside sure. and really focus on what it is you know what's going to resonate with our user our client our student our you know whoever that is um really being able to to and it's hard it's hard to kind of give up yourself or give up your baby or give up your fantastic idea <laughs> like and that's where like i said it's it's nice to have somebody to kind of help you get through learning design thinking so you get used to doing that are there people that are more predisposed to being able to sort of follow this system or do you feel like anyone can do it it might be easier for some people to take it on but i think everybody eventually i mean they get it and I've actually got some really um, interest. I have some fun training tools that I use um, that really take it into a fun space first. So you can see in a non-threatening way how design thinking is beneficial. And then you can turn it over to your organization and say, so we're just gonna do the same thing here. You know, and the other thing we need to remember about when we talk about innovation or thinking outside the box and things like that um, is that that doesn't mean innovate. Actually, if you look at the root word, it means to renew. It means to build on what you already have. It doesn't mean take everything you've done for the history of your organization and toss it. 
you know, we talk a lot about transformation and all these kinds of things, but really what we're doing is building on what we have. And that's the thing is you got to want to keep building um, because, you know, I said the world, you know, it's not standing still. And if we just stay where we are, eventually we're going to become irrelevant or obsolete. And so I think um, I said part of it is just introducing the process in a really um, friendly, non-threatening way. And people get it because it's, it's actually, um, it's very freeing. <laughs> because now when you're making a decision, you're like, oh, I'm making this decision, you know, on a, like on a solid foundation, like I have a reason. I mean, it's that start with why piece. I, now I have my why, you know, that's heading me in the right direction. And I can talk to other people about, you know, what the decision pro making process was. And, and it sounds legitimate, you know, instead of just we decided to do this. So it actually gives you some, some really good um, data to use with your public as well. Well, a question about the um, your earlier slide where it showed the, the messy squiggly lines. I mean, all the commentary I've seen about design thinking is that it's very upfront about this is a messy process. Mm -hmm. um, it's I think you know people that have been conditioned to you know looking at very crisp polygons and lines in a process chart or the you know the, the perfect uh, you know um, dependency flow of a Gantt chart or something like that must uh have must give must take pause with something like this you must face a lot of organizational resistance if not individual resistance in well i think for most i think that's true like a lot of people are used to having things very scheduled or organized um and it's not to say that design thinking is not um it becomes that way but it's in that beginning process and i think you can really um, I strive to connect the process to my clients um, before we even start. And so like with the example of education, lesson planning in and of itself is design thinking. And teachers do design thinking on their feet all day, every day, because they're essentially looking at what it is they need to, you know, accomplish, coming up with a plan, like looking, who are my students? What do we, you know, what's our time? How much time do we have? What are they, you know, all that stuff. So they're doing that observation, they come up with their prototype, they teach it, and as they're teaching it, they're constantly iterating it. This is working, sure. this is working, this is going better than I thought it would, so I'm going to have extra time. So they're doing design thinking in like every minute of the day. <laughs> so if you can connect to, and I think everybody does in their job, they're just not necessarily aware of it or doing it on as large of a scale. And so if you can show people that relevancy and connect it, like, we all know the most successful things we've done come out of having done this process, whether or not we did it, you know, in these, with these exact step names, <laughs> it's when we stop to really plan things out and consider all the factors and then put something out, you know, that it becomes a workable solution. And so I think that primary connection to who are you as a company or organization first, and then demonstrate how you're already doing design thinking really is a helpful piece because it does come down to, and, and it eventually gets to that straight line and you're still on it. I mean, in fact, constraints are an important part of design thinking because it forces you to be more creative. If I only have, you know, two weeks to get this figured out, you know, <laughs> then, then we got to get going and we got to do it. You know, we can really time out those steps and get, get to the process. Well, I see we're running out of time. Okay. I want to thank you for joining us today today. Oh, Let's tell our listeners and our watchers, where else can we find you? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, and I typically go by my name, Carol Glanville, C.A. Glanville. And that's at LinkedIn on Twitter. Um, you can find me at my Contemporary Education Solutions site, which is contemporaryedsolutions.com. You can see it on the slide there. 